Good afternoon, everyone, um, <coughs> to the Institute of Rural Politics. Uh, my name is Annalisa Quinn with the Alumni Board. Um, and thank you for attending this lecture. Um, this is, for those of you who are new to IWP, is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have a five master's degree program, 18 certified uh, certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you are interested in learning more about us, please feel free to speak to one of our staff at the conclusion of this meeting. Please note that for this lecture, filming and recording is not permitted. If you would like to ask a question, please uh, please use the given question cards to submit them to the staff member at the question period. So if you don't have one of those uh, yet, uh, please ask for one. Um, our speaker today is Rebecca Koffler, who is a threat and intelligence expert on Russian doctrine and strategy, and a former U.S. intelligence officer who specializes in strategic intelligence analysis of the Russian threat, including cyber, to the U.S. and Western security. As a recognized IC excerpt, expert on Russia, Ms. Koffler delivered classified briefings to top U.S. military commanders, the White House National Security Council, the directors of the CIA and DIA, NATO, senior congressional staff, and the vice chairman select of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Born, or, born and raised in the former Soviet Union and educated both in Russia and the United States, Rebecca is Russia, Russian and English bilingual and has a deep understanding of the Russian strategic culture, mindset, and behavior. Ms. Koffler holds an MA in International Transactions from the George Mason University in Virginia, a BA and MA in Foreign Languages from Moscow State Pedagogical University, and a, and a graduate certificate in intelligence from the Institute of Rural Politics. She is the founder of a national security consultancy, uh, Doctrine and Strategic Consultancy, LLC. Um, if you could uh, welcome her along with me here today. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Alex, for this great introduction. Uh, thank you uh, to the Institute for putting this together. Um, just a little while ago, you uh, uh, couldn't uh, really hold people's attention uh, when it came to Russia, but uh, even uh, certain presidential candidates were mocked in uh, 2012 when they said that uh, Russia is the greatest geopolitical threat to the United States. And uh, now, here we are. Um, so, I'd like to uh, dedicate this uh, briefing to um, potential students, the candidates um, of this institute. The institute has done a lot uh, for me. I have learned a lot of analytic tradecraft from uh, the Institute for um, Institute of World Politics. Uh, before we proceed, just to make it clear that uh, this lecture is unclassified, obviously I'm no longer uh, with the government. Um, it is based exclusively on open sources, uh, including the uh, open source materials in the original Russian language uh, that are not available to most people without the language capability and uh, expertise in uh, the frontal analysis. Um, I also would like to state that uh, any views in this briefing uh, belong solely to me and Doctor and Strategy uh, Consulting LLC and um, do not represent the views of the United States government or any other government or any other organization uh, for that purpose. Uh, okay, now without uh, further ado, um, I would like to uh, state bottom, what we call bottom line up front, bottom line assessment, uh, and that is uh, for the next decade, Russia will pose a significant foreign policy challenge and security concern to the United States. Moscow, which believes it's in a long-term confrontation with Washington, will conduct continue aggressive actions, especially in the cyber domain thus risking escalation, albeit unintended, of existing tensions and hostilities. How did we arrive at that? So, uh, I'm going to uh, walk you through an outline uh, that I'm going to follow um, that will help us understand um, 
break down the analysis. We're going to start at, um, uh, at a macro level uh, with the cultural context, uh, proceed to threat perception, strategic aims and objectives, military doctrine, strategy, nuclear policy, and then uh, uh, focus on information confrontation and cyber, do a little bit of our historical analysis uh, with regard to active measures, um, and then um, go tactical, sort of uh, look at the uh, 2016 influence uh, campaign and close with uh, takeaways. Cultural context. So I, I, I like to start with that because that kind of is the uh, crux of the matter. A lot of the uh, Russian behavior is, uh, is rooted in, in that culture. Um, I'd like to mention uh, five main, there are probably a lot of, you know, a lot of factors how the Russians are different from Americans and the uh, sort of the, the otherness of, uh, of cultures is clearly manifested in, uh, in the Russian psyche. But I'd like to focus on the uh, top five. That is exceptionalism, sense of uniqueness and exceptionalism, uh, presupposition of conflict, um, worst case scenario mindset, collectivism uh, as opposed to individualism and uh, central power of the state. So we'll start with uh, exceptionalism. Just like the United States uh, believes that uh, uh, we are exceptional, uh, Russia also believes that Russia is unique and exceptional and also that uniqueness is divinely inspired. Um, where do they derive this uh, sense of uniqueness? Um, there are several factors. Um, that, that's how they explain it. Uh, basically, first, it's the um, it occupies the largest land mass. It uh, straddles both uh, Europe and Asia, um, multiple time zones, obviously rich in natural resources. Um, it possesses the largest arsenal uh, of nuclear weapons um, other than the United States, but also Russia believes it uh, contributed in a major way to the world uh, culture, science, etc. Uh, what do they mean by that? You know, the launch of uh, Sputnik, the first you know, the satellite, and the first human, uh, the, um, this home to the uh, the founder of the periodic table of um, elements, you know, Medvedev, you know, home to Tchaikovsky, the Nutcracker, and of course, Alphonse. That, that's, that's, that's just a joke. Uh, but, 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 yet, yeah, truly, so they do, they do believe um, that, that they're very special, and they have a very special part, uh, if you will, and a very special mission in um, in in life and, and in history. They also believe that uh, they need to defend that land, land mass. Um, the country has experienced multiple invasions, you know, throughout history, revolutions, etc. And it has this this very uh, uh, deep concern, the fear of instability, and it, it just has that presupposition of conflict. That it says they're always in conflict. They always need to, to, to defend themselves. Now, they, they, they play, obviously, they play up that part a lot, you know, um, um, there's a certain narrative of victimhood that, that they like to, um, um, that they like to uh, espouse. Um, so they, they also believe that if, if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. So, so therefore, you know, when another country, you know, primarily the United States, if, if they notice that we're developing, you know, certain capabilities, they immediately think it's about them. Everything has to be about them because they have that, that concern uh, that uh, it's not a matter of if, uh, but when the conflict will arise. So collectivism, you know, it's a collectivist society. So the, the individual, um, uh, serves the state essentially, and uh, they, they believe in the central power of the state because they need to defend that land, 
and, uh, and, and not only that, they believe in shaping the future generations in a mindset. And a lot of indoctrination. Um, so, but because there's this sense of uh, insecurity, um, even the Russian population prefers stability to chaos, and they would sacrifice some certain, you know, certain personal freedoms uh, in order to have that stability. That is partly explains why Putin has these, you know, high, uh, high ratings despite all of the repression that goes on. Um, things like that. So we're moving on to, um, so, so, so that's the baseline, basically. Um, the reason I spent so much time usually on this is because everything begins with this. Russia uh, interprets everything through this prism. So any, uh, even innocuous, you know, activities I interpreted with, uh, with the, um, with the uh, worst case in our mindset. So, um, threat perceptions. Russia believes the United States and uh, NATO are its principal threat. So, this threat perception actually is codified in uh, the Russian uh, strategic planning document, the military doctrine, uh, the national security strategy, the foreign policy concept, and, and, and others. And, um, and how did they arrive at, to, to that conclusion? Uh, basically, they have um, they have witnessed, they say, uh, the United States uh, military operations in the last uh, couple of decades, and uh, they have taken note of the conventional superiority, they believe they're conventionally inferior to us, and uh, they also believe that the United States actually fomented a series of color revolutions. So they actually codified color revolution as, as a threat. And so taking that worst case scenario mindset, they believe, you know, you know, after Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Libya, the next one could be them, given that you know Putin is widely disliked in, in, in the West. So um, the other couple of uh, threats that are way down on the on the prior list is terrorism and religious extremism. And the reason for that is, um, and, and they usually don't call it that way, but they are concerned with Muslim extremism. Uh, Muslims are the fastest growing ethnic group in, uh, in Russia, and they're concerned about radicalization. Um, and the final is China. So that's, that's the threat that the Russians typically don't speak about. And uh, the recent March um, uh, reporting on that. However, we are lucky that the, uh, there's an outstanding report that uh, just came out in 2017 uh, uh, by the Defense Intelligence Agency, my former agency called the Russian Military Power, that calls out that threat, um, uh, the China threat. So, uh, moving on to strategic aims and objectives. So, the primary the primary goal, basically, of, uh, of the Kremlin is its uh, regime survival, the regime's hold on power. Putin, you know, as, as I mentioned before, they believe in the central role of the state, they believe in their way of life, and uh, only the regime can provide to them that way of life. So, uh, the next one is um, <coughs> to arrest the perceived erosion of the strategic buffer. That, um, they believe that with the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, the West, meaning us, have, uh, and the United States especially, by encroachment of NATO close to Russia's territory, the strategic buffer, buffer protecting the heartland uh, has been eroded. And therefore, they'd like to, to stop that. So, um, and... A, couple, uh, a few other ones that, again, have been codified. These are the strategic goals. Uh, they would like to become the leading geopolitical power globally. They would like to be a dominant uh, player in Eurasia, in what they call the, uh, their backyard, their uh, sphere of privileged interest. And, uh, and who is in the way to those ambitions? Is as, as you could tell, it's it, it's us. It's the United States and NATO, uh, and 
So the Putin government has made the decision that they need to weaken uh, the United States, they need to weaken the alliance, they need to weaken the, um, the United States influence globally, and their desired strategic outcome would be a uh, multipolar world with Russia having a seat at the table in all the major you know, world affair events where it can serve as the uh, arbiter of international relations and the so-called uh, principal body of, of peace. Uh, peace is typically interpreted uh, not, not necessarily in the same uh, uh, way that we do in the status quo. So, um, doesn't matter if uh, if the government uh, blesses its people, it's still um, uh, peace because the government fights for people. Um, so these are the threat perceptions that they have uh, come up with, and there's actually entities that uh, military entities that um, whose business it is to develop these so-called um, uh, threat assessments, the uh, assessment of the, what they call the military political uh, situation, the, uh, the VPO. So what are you going to do about that threat? Once you codify that threat doctrinally, um, you got to do something about that. So, so obviously, uh, they uh, have developed a military doctrine, and they periodically they, they, um, update these doctrines. So the most recent one, uh, was approved by uh, President Putin in, excuse me, in uh, December 2014. It, um, so, um, as I said, it codifies the threat. It, um, it highlights uh, Russia's need for maintaining a superior nuclear capability, but also a superior um, conventional capability, and in addition, a capability that they call uh, strategic non-nuclear. And what they mean by that is uh, precision-guided munitions. Uh, they really marveled at the operations that uh, we conducted with, uh, with the use of those uh, PGMs, and, um, and, um, and, and they want to be just like us. Um, the, the doctrine also um, highlighted something that's called guaranteed unacceptable damage to the aggressor. Uh, it highlighted mo uh, the need for mo mobilization and strategic deployment. Um, it typically highlights the importance of maintaining strategic initiative in the conflict. And uh, it mentioned actually in this one the five red lines that would trigger a military response. So in addition to that, um, uh, the actual official doctrine, uh, there's a document, of, it's not rather a document, it's a, it's a report by the chief of uh, Russian general staff, uh, General Gerasimov, um, who is a rough equivalent to our uh, General Dunford. Um, and in that, uh, it's basically called the value of military science is in forecasting. And he identifies the principal trends. Uh, there, are about, there are a lot of trends, but there are about three or five that I'm going to uh, just mention here. Um, the first thing uh, he talks about is the blurring lines between the war and peace. Uh, he also talks about the role of non-military and non-combat methods of warfare gaining uh, prominence in the current nature and character of war. Uh, he also uh, talks about the information operations and the special operations forces, the role of these two being the primary instruments in, 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 uh, in current uh, warfare. A couple of other interesting uh, pieces of information uh, he gave us openly in that uh, report, and that is about the unique uh, way of defeating the opponent 
would be by cultivating an opposition internally within the states, within the actual state, the, the opponent state. Uh, some analysts actually believe um, that uh, he foreshadowed the Ukraine, uh, Russia's, uh, what someone else called hybrid operations, I think United States uh, Army um, document, there's one for document that uh, called Outplayed in the Gray Zone um, that uh, talks about uh, General Gerasimov uh, pretty much uh, foreshadowing how they're going to conduct warfare uh, in Ukraine. And, um, and so um, that assessment also talks about uh, the gray zone. So that war in line between war and peace, that uh, Russia's uh, perception that they're constantly in, in a conflict really um, uh, works well. They're really trying to exploit the, uh, that legally very nebulous zone uh, by conducting operations just below the threshold of the military response of the opponent. So that's, um, in a nutshell, is the military doctrine. There's, there's a lot more to it, but uh, um, trying to stay on time uh, here. So in addition to the doctrine, so the doctrine um, uh, in, the, in the Russian doctrinal framework is different than, than in blue in, in ours. Ours is more tactical. Uh, this is more like sort of a, it's more of a policy. So the strategy is what is a little bit more tactical. Uh, so, so Russia actually has codified uh, what they call a strategy of containment. Uh, some people translate it as a strategy, a deterrent strategy, but um, um, uh, my translation is strategy of containment because it's a strategy of containment Воздерживание actually uh, has the connotation of holding something back, like it's a very it's active, you know, active uh, defense. So, so interestingly, in uh, July 2014, President Putin approved something called Plan for Strategic Containment and Conflict Prevention by an edict, presidential edict. Um, so, this the strategy again. The different elements of the strategies that are codified in all of these various uh, strategic planning documents. So I'm going to call out a few elements uh, uh, that Gerasimov uh, also highlighted in in, in his uh, what uh, some people believe the seminal paper turned out to be seminal paper, uh, and that is an indirect and asymmetric action. Basically, they believe that because they're the weak power, they're conventionally inferior, they would like to use the non-traditional uh, methods um, in order to compensate for that inferiority. And what are the non-traditional you know, methods? The use of uh, you know, special forces without insignia, the fomenting of, uh, of revolts using the uh, uh, local population, you know, sabotage and, 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 and other things. Um, but the, the, um, the objective of that uh, containment strategy is, is actually to uh, change the decision-making calculus of an adversary, to present the adversary with a conundrum, to give him a risk, to, to, to telegraph to the adversary that there's a risk to both your action and your inaction. Right. Yeah, look at Ukraine, uh, for, for example. The, um, the risk of action in, in, in the Russian mind is, is obviously uh, potential escalation of a conflict with nuclear power. And they continuously remind us, you know, that they are the nuclear superpower, that they're going to do this, that, and the other, including reducing their space to nuclear ash. You know, if someone heard that um, phrase by a Kremlin-affiliated uh, journalist. Um, and, uh, and so, therefore, um, the United States better not get into the Ukraine you know, conflict in their backyard, right? So that's the risk of uh, escalation going all the way up to the nuclear war. And uh, the risk of an action, obviously, is the 
um, is um, fracturing the, the unity of the alliance because the Western the Western alliance, you know, seeks to um, to help the former uh, Russian satellites, uh, so to speak, uh, gain their freedom. You know, uh, choose their own path of uh, of development, whether it's a Western path or whatever they want. So, so, so that would be that would be that's the conundrum. Uh, nuclear policy again is codified in uh, military doctrine, and it continuously is reiterated uh, by um, various members of the Russian government, including President Putin himself. So there's a declaratory policy that states that is you know written in the actual uh, 2014 document, uh, and that is that Russia will employ nuclear weapons in response to a nuclear or other WMD attack against Russia or allies, or in a conventional conflict when the very existence of the state is threatened. Now, leave it to, for us to interpret who are their allies and uh, what they mean by the very existence of the state being uh, threatened, not to please the regime. There's also a non-declaratory policy um, that's what we assess and that's what um, actually U.S. government assesses as reflected in the uh, recent uh, nuclear, nuclear review posture that just came out in 2018 as well as U.S. national security strategy. Um, and what is that non-declaratory policy? Non-declaratory policy um, is referred to as escalate to de-escalate. Uh, Russia actually believes that um, it would need to employ non-strategic nuclear weapons in order to de-escalate the conflict. Sounds counterintuitive, but uh, they believe that they, if they demonstrate their resolve, in a conflict, then the United States, the West, would uh, back down. So um, the um, our current administration actually called them out on that, and uh, uh, the uh, 2018 nuclear posture review actually uh, clearly telegraphed to Russia that uh, they ought not to make that misinterpretation of the United States resolve. And, uh, First, nuclear use is not permitted, and uh, if such thing were to happen, uh, the United States would respond accordingly. And now there are plans to um, to develop certain low yield uh, capabilities in order to uh, disabuse Russia of that uh, notion. Um, so uh, now we're moving on actually to the um, to the cyber piece. And I only call it cyber peace uh, as the shorthand. The Russians um, actually uh, refer to it as information operation or information confrontation. They have a very different conception than um, than um, than us um, as far as what uh, information operations are. We are primarily not primarily, but we're focused. We're looking at it from the sort of the network standpoint. We're looking at cyber. They're looking at the content, um, in addition to to the um, to the technical piece. So the information security doctrine was uh, adopted in uh, November or December uh, 2016. <coughs> Very interesting document. I commend it to anyone who uh, studies Russia and especially information um, security. Codifies uh, that information threats are actually national security threats. Why is that? So um, Russia has a unique conception of sovereignty. They believe that sovereignty actually um, extends to all domains, not just the physical domain, but uh, all domains, in, including the information domain. They believe that population is under attack uh, by Western culture and Western influence. And they're talking about you know, Hollywood movies and, 
and CNN and uh, all, you know those kinds of things that actually Russian people like to watch. Um, so they have codified that the Russian national identity is 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 actually um, is a priority, and the need to defend it is a priority. Right, so so uh, they said they, they said therefore um, the the information domain can 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 serve and does serve currently as a battlefield, and specifically that's how conflict arises, and what they refer to is uh, is the Arab Spring. They actually believe that. Um, that the United States government fomented some of the, you know, again, those uprisings uh, deliberately by uh, its policy of promoting democracy. So, <clears throat> again, this, this doctrine, information security doctrine, it's called, uh, actually codified that special operation forces of certain states increasingly conduct information psychological influence campaign in order to destabilize internal social order of various parts of the world and undermine sovereignty and territorial integrity of other states. What does that sound to you like? Um, so again, Russians uh, have the ability to uh, foreshadow what they're going to do about projecting. They think like that's what the adversary is going to do, uh, and therefore they're going to do it to the, uh, to the uh, adversary. Um, the doctrine uh, calls out specifically for the protection of critical infrastructure. In peacetime, period of imminent threat, and wartime. And I'll explain to you why that is important in a couple of, uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, the doctrine also has codified the central role of the Russian president in information security system. At the same time as the, uh, as the Russian president signed the um, plan for strategic deterrence and conflict prevention, July 2013, he also signed another plan called the Information Confrontation Plan. So um, our assessment is that that is a central and integral part of the containment strategy. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like you to pay attention to the date, July 2013. Um, how do they define information computation um, in Russian Informationsprotivogorsk? So again, it goes. It's a Protivogorsk confrontation. It's it's a process. You continuously you know, resisting, you're continuously confronting somebody, confront that threat that they have, um, they believe is, you know, is about to encircle them, or eventually to encircle them. Encirclement is a big part of the Russian psyche. Um, so, uh, so here's the definition. Intense confrontation in the information sphere aimed at achieving informational, psychological, and ideological superiority, imposing damage, to the information systems, processes, resources, critically important structures and means of communication, and also sabotaging a social and social system, massive psychological influence on troops and population. So at this point, I'd like to direct to take a little bit of um, excursion into history, because information computation is nothing new. Uh, it's actually akin to the active measures. And uh, I put the definition of information confrontation and active measures uh, right next to each other in this very uh, little difference. Information confrontation is actually cyber-enabled active measures. That's what it is. The active measures is a combination of overt and covert operations conducted by intelligence services for the purpose of influencing countries' politics and policies, confuse their opponents, sabotage his positions, and disrupt his plans, and also to achieve other purposes. What are other purposes? Uh, something that uh, the Russians used to do 
uh, under Stalin, and that is uh, covert uh, assassinations. Uh, active measures actually something that dates way back to uh, 1920s. Um, and uh, there's an excellent class that I don't know if it's still taught at the Institute of World Politics that Professor Waller used to teach. Um, and uh, other professors will tell you um, uh, really, really great uh, information on, uh, on active measures. Um, the objective is actually discredit U.S. leaders, uh, democracy, and advance the Russian or way back then Soviet uh, objectives and gain political and diplomatic advantage. The very first um, active measures operations um, is believed to be something called the trust, and it's a very um, it's a very clever, devious and uh, horrifying operations. Basically, what the Russians did is, uh, after the, um, the Bolshevik Revolution, they created a fake counter-revolutionary committee, uh, or, or trust, the Tres, or Syndicat. And, uh, and so they would send intelligence officers, um, including illegals, uh, to Western countries to identify the opposition. And the cover story that was given was, um, if you come to Russia and help us, you know, you know, destroy the Bolshevism, you know, and, 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 and you know, foment the revolution, uh, we need help. They actually flew people. They got them passports. They 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 took them to the facilities in in Moscow uh, that was supposed to be that uh, counter revolutionary uh, committee of Priest and uh, brought their families in, and so, and then one by one, they eliminated them physically. So, and that was a way of elimination of the, the opposition. So, um, so some other very prominent active measures campaign uh, was um, uh, targeting uh, President Reagan's um, election in 94, I believe. There's an outstanding document that was just declassified in 2013, a congressional uh, report, where basically it goes through the, uh, the intelligence, the very sophisticated intelligence operation um, in coordination with the Communist Party USA um, to deny uh, former President Reagan his presidency and the story was spread of, uh, of a collusion, imagine that word again, um, between the FBI and uh, a committee for un-American, um, I have it somewhere, yes, the collusion with the FBI and the House Committee of, on Un-American Activities Concerning Communist Infiltration into the Hollywood Film World. Uh, there was a forgery that was done to them, uh, that, that was uh, part of that, and that dated back to 1947, that, uh, that purported that. And uh, forgery, there's a very uh, creative way that they do forgeries, you know, things like that. So the Russians actually spent uh, $4 billion annually on active measures, according to declassified CIA estimates, um, that was in 1987. So one of the other famous um, uh, disinformation campaign was um, about um, Russians portraying uh, that the HIV AIDS was uh, developed uh, by the United States. Uh, um, so the current uh, narratives, uh, information confrontation or disinformation narratives that Russia uses is that um, the Western culture is decadent, it's in decline. Um, the Russian values are traditional, conservative, morally superior. Um, and, and, and how do they arrive at that? They basically point to the, um, to the social agendas, the, uh, the, the spread of you know, the transgender, the homosexuality, the change of uh, uh, traditional uh, definition of marriage, and those kinds of things. So, and they're saying, uh, look, we are really the, the principal guardian of conservative of values, Russia that is, and would like to offer to the world an alternative value system that is more, you know, in line with the original Western traditions. So, uh, so again, um, another uh, uh, narrative is that the United States 
uh, is destabilizing the, the strategic stability by developing and deploying ballistic missile defense from, from global strike, uh, space weapons, information weapons, and, and things like that. So, um, so before we go into the actual uh, the 2016 operation, um, I'd like to uh, just tell you a couple of words about the foundational basis for active measures uh, and therefore information confrontation. It's, it's a theory called reflexive control theory. Uh, its founder was a Russian mathematician uh, Vladimir Lefebvre. Uh, he subsequently um, immigrated um, to the United States. Uh, but basically, he was a mathematician who tried to predict through algorithms the probability of a person making this or that decision. So, in order to do that, you have to really get into the psyche of your opponent, right? So, so the flex control theory therefore stipulates um, that it's an actions designed to convey specially prepared information to the opponent to incline him to voluntarily make predetermined decision designed by the initiator of the action. And voluntarily is the key word here. So, um, so what it, it requires really deep understanding of the opponent's psychology and its biases, and uh, that's what um, that's what we saw in the 2016 uh, operation. Um, understanding of that psychology, or at least attempting to understand the, really the social dynamic of uh, our society. So, so the Russians actually believe that there's a direct connection between information operations and uh, reflexive control. So a couple of words on the main ca uh, categories of, uh, of information operations. There's, uh, there are three categories, uh, collection of intelligence, that's traditional espionage, um, just like any other <clears throat> int, you know, segment, uh, human, illness, etc. Everybody does that, you know, including, including Russia. Um, active measures, though, is a unique Russian tradecraft. So uh, the next category is strategic targeting, strategic reconnaissance, rather, for future targeting. And then the final is the actual offensive operations. And uh, you will, I'll, I'll show how, how they play out. Um, the quick examples of the most, they obviously have conducted a lot of operations by now, and they were pretty widely covered um, <coughs> by both the cybersecurity uh, community. The leading companies put out really great reports. Uh, there are a number of former intelligence officers now employed by these companies, you know, such as FireEye, uh, Mandiant, etc., CrowdStrikes, and they apply that unique tradecraft right, um, um, to analyzing analyzing the threat. So the uh, the operations um, started way back in 1999. Something called uh, Moonlight Maze. Uh, so the Russians were thinking about that, obviously, for a long time. Uh, and targets were both civilian and military targets, and then uh, they were quiet for, for a long time. It was, uh, quiet does not mean inoperable, necessarily, but stealthy. As the former director of national intelligence, uh, Jim Clapp, was um, characterized in one of his um, interviews is that the Chinese are very loud inside the space and Russians are very stealthy. Well, that, that has changed, obviously, uh, recently. Um, but so in 2015, we saw them uh, uh, connecting intrusions in the White House, the State Department, uh, Pentagon. You know, there was something called Cyber Caliphate that was, that was later uh, assessed to be um, uh, Russian sponsored or originated, rather, when CENTCOM's uh, Twitter accounts were, uh, were hacked, uh, 10,000 users were affected. Um, and obviously, the 2016 intervention in the US presidential election was the, uh, was the most um, uh, visible. And we're going to go straight to that. Um, there's a uh, wonderful document in the open domain, and that's the Department of Justice uh, indictment. 
that uh, sheds uh, quite a bit of light. So if you marry this with a doctrine, you know, um, you really would have a clear understanding of uh, what occurred. And uh, so basically in 2013, that's again that date, July 2013, the internet research uh, company uh, got registered and we all know by now, I assume that what internet research agency is, that's the, uh, that's the actual you know, cover company that uh, conducted, employed the people and the analysts and the technical experts, the Russian ones, that, um, that uh, studied the U.S. cyber domain, information domain, and the social, you know, issues, and really got the understanding um, uh, 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 with, the, with the intention to so uh, discord. Um, so in 2014, they started operating. They started that analysis, you know, to the point where they conducted, you know, they had matrix of, um, um, you know, comments to, to uh, like Twitter, to blogging, uh, the amount of comments per posting. So as we know, they used our social media platform, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to um, uh, they posed as uh, Americans. And uh, they um, created web pages um, to, to really amplify the, the various um, various issues, various tensions within society, racial, you know, issues, um, um, gun control, um, police uh, brutality, the role or the place of Muslim Americans in the society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so and. Uh, the, the intent, here's um, the analysis um, is this, um, and uh, here is slightly different from the uh, analysis that was um, um, codified in the 2017, January 6, 2017, uh, US intelligence community where three agencies out of the community um, CIA, NSA, and FBI um, came to the conclusion that um, that uh, the Russians did interfere in the elections uh, with the intentions to um, to uh, elect you know the current president Donald Trump. In addition to so discord, so my minor nuance is. Yes, indeed, I completely agree with the assessment that uh, the primary idea was to fuel discontent, foment chaos, possibly even popular unrest, undermine the Americans' voters' confidence in the electoral process in the government institutions, and um, and uh, I don't believe they necessarily uh, tried to elect the current president. Uh, traditionally, they play their, their party agnostic. Their main objective is to really disrupt the disunity, to cause, you know, to cause um, uh, discord, chaos, and that instability. That goes to that um, strategy of containment. The more you weaken your your opponent, and as we know, they believe that we are the principal Edison, the better off they are. As you remember, the dates. Uh, July 2013, shortly after Gerasimov's uh, article, shortly after uh, the uh, information computation plan and the strategic uh, containment plan were adopted, and what else happened early in 2014 when the campaign, they, they codenamed it the uh, Project Translator. That's the uh, 2016. <coughs> Uh, operation. Um, what else happened in 2014, early 2014, the invasion of Crimea, right? Um, so I believe that um, that's the assessment of uh, doctrine strategy consulting is that the one of the primary objectives was also to discredit the legitimacy of the president, either one of them, right? Uh, so that the president comes in and it would be he would he or she would be in a position to um, to govern the society that doesn't believe the president is legitimate. So uh, so in a way it was also for that. So so denying 
Uh, Mrs. Clinton, her presidency was just a side benefit uh, for Putin because obviously he said he had personal animus towards uh, Mrs. Clinton. Um, it was uh, he wanted to pay her back, right, for something that he believes, you know, she was behind, and that is the popular protests in Moscow in 20, late 2011, uh, 2012, as well as the uh, Ukraine crisis. The Russians believe that it is us who actually fomented that, that crisis by pushing very hard on Ukraine to join the, um, the EU and uh, causing that protest and having Yanukovych fled. And they basically accuse us of, of um, overthrowing the legitimately uh, elected um, president of Ukraine. So the fact that they tried to intrude in uh, some of the electoral boards, state and local, is the false flag, I believe. Remember, reflexive control, it's not necessarily what happened, whether there was, um, as the intelligence you know, community, uh, several you know, top leaders, including James Pepper, you know, said that we cannot measure the effect, right? How do we know whether the election was actually impacted? We don't. But it doesn't really matter to the Russians. It's planting the idea in your head that you have an illegitimate president, that you didn't elect him, whoever, whichever one, or the president who is corrupt. You know, that was the purpose of, you know, uh, making those documents, the, the, the emails released to, uh, to Wikileaks, right? And uh, so, so that's that, um, that campaign. And uh, other examples of strategic ops, you know, include, um, Russians uh, conducting LRA, long uh, range aviations, you know, nuclear bombers um, off of our coast, you know, sending nuclear powered attack submarines within 200 uh, miles of um, US's coast in 2009, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, really quickly, one new doctrinal, very important um, uh, development, I believe, that. Um, Russians have developed, they have just recently this month, acknowledged something that's called strategic operation to defeat critical infrastructure of the enemy. And what did we just uh, hear um, from the Treasury, from our Treasury Department, that just put on sanctions on entities that were uh, responsible for conducting intrusions in the United States critical infrastructure, right? We have 16, about 16, I think, critical infrastructure um, designated by the Department of Homeland Security. Nuclear sector is but one of them. So the Russians actually got their hands on, got access, I should say, that could be misinterpreted, can say that. Um, the Russians actually got access to our nuclear infrastructure. Remember that second category for strategic um, reconnaissance with the idea of holding targets at risk? That is my analysis. That's the new analysis that I have not read anywhere else yet, that the strategic operation to defeat critical infrastructure of the enemy is being potentially now not necessarily tested, but enabled by mapping out access. They got access to our infrastructure. And there are writings in the, uh, in the professional military press uh, that reflect Russian interest in our critical infrastructure. So I'm going to pretty much close. I have one slide of the government assessment of the Russian threat, but you can read it on your own if you pull up any of the uh, statement, you know, open uh, testimony, you know, <laughs> assessments that, um, you know, DNI does, that uh, any um, confirmation hearings, so we're pretty much, you know, um, in, 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 in sync uh, for the most part, my analysis. Um, 
Uh, but uh, U.S. government is uh, conducting a very robust response, this administration, to um, to Russia right now. Um, so, and the key takeaways are what? So, basically, it tracks Russian activities track very well with their doctrinal writings. There are really no no big surprises for anybody who's been tracking this uh, problem set. Um, Next one, it's a very patient, it's a very determined and patient strategic opponent. They, two years ahead of the election, before any of the candidates actually, you know, announced, right? Three years, 2013, they started this process, right? In the case of Ronald Reagan's uh, back to 1984, um, nine, uh, four years in advance, they started preparing the, the operations. It's an answer to the near-peer military and cyber capability. It requires very continuous monitoring um, of indications and warnings, intelligence, and in-depth study. And that's something that the students will learn at this institute. There's a very good course uh, on strategic intelligence and the INW indicators that allow us to forecast the threat. I'm going to close with this and take questions. I apologize if it took such a long time. I'm going to take the easy ones first. Have you assessed the role of uh, GRU in these active measures? You know, central role. I think it's yes. Um, the 2017 assessment, uh, January 6th, identifies that role. Um, There are a lot of Cold War era uh, leaders making decisions and in interpreting the world's state of affairs. What can you say about the internet set in millennial generations and the perception of the world? I cannot say anything about it because that's blue. I assume you're asking me to analyze U.S. millennials, and I'm just not in that business. Um, apologies. Uh, I, I analyze the uh, Russian doctrine strategy. Um, How do you view presented, uh, the presented Russia's codes for security playing out? I can walk in this. With the US and Europe, the front of the administration. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Uh, Elaine? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you see the security codes that with Russia? has been employing and presently is actively employing, I didn't put that in, uh, playing out with the current, uh, uh, against the, with U.S. and Europe, with the current, with Trump and his current administration. What do you mean by security codes? Well, okay, you have, you have delineated mm -hmm. numerous activities. Right. In which have been codified yes. by uh, Rush, Russians, Russia's government, Mr. Right, Biden right, specifically, right. you were speaking about this code, this code, this code. 
So there are really two never. There's a whole host of them and their activities. So with the activities designed to create the kind of chaos which mm -hmm. as you use right, the term right, right. yourself, uh, how do you see this playing out in the current environment with the Trump with President Trump and, and his administration? So if you're asking me again to assess the administration actions, I'm, I'm not no, in that business. I'm asking you to assess their actions. Their action. reaction. Okay. No, their so, actions. I'm asking got you, it. How you see got it. how they see it playing out with the U.S. and Europe, with Trump and yes. his administration. Their view of how right. they see it. Got it. Right. Got it. Obviously, uh, they don't like they don't like the sanctions. Uh, sanctions, you know. Hurt. They don't acknowledge it hurt. They don't hurt as much. They're able to mitigate the, the, the pain. They actually put in, in place um, what Christine Lagarde, the, um, the head of the International Monetary Fund, uh, termed uh, admirable macroeconomic uh, framework to mitigate the impact of the sanctions and the economic downturn. Um, as a result of the dual shocks of the uh, reduction in oil prices and, and the sanctions. So obviously they don't like that. Uh, they have already reacted to the uh, nuclear posture review and uh, they did say that uh, whichever yield, small yield or large yield, or whichever yield our nuclear weapons in the United States uh, develops, Russia will be able to respond. Um, so that being said, and, and they continue with their rhetoric, they continue with the strategic containment narrative, and that is, you know, the United States destabilizes the world and the whole bit, right? At the same time, what is notable is that there was no Russian reaction to the administration's order to uh, strike Russian mercenaries in Syria. That went unnoticed. Uh, there's also, uh, not by the Russians obviously, but it didn't get any kind of uh, rhetoric back. And uh, another uh, interesting bit of information, uh, President Putin just recently requested through the Chancellor of Austria, the meeting with President Trump. So they do want to work with us. Uh, Putin himself actually in the uh, recent um, direct line um, interview that he, that he did, uh, did state that we do want to work with the United States and we will make compromises. However, there are certain conditions. He didn't, he didn't elaborate, so he doesn't want to be the pariah necessarily. He's very comfortable being in that role. He's very comfortable being a counterweight to the United States, especially, you know, if you notice that at the same time that we had the G7 meeting, the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, that very same, um, very few couple days, you know, met as well. He's very comfortable with uh, the Chinese president. He's reaching out to Saudi Arabia. He's reaching out to everybody. So, so basically, bottom line, to answer your questions, he doesn't like some of the actions that we're taking. He's going to continue his line. The strategy of containment is continue, but it doesn't preclude uh, the Russians from sitting down with us and talking and resolving some issues. And there are issues, obviously, to resolve. I mean, um, so, so they do talk. But they will pursue a very pragmatic, transactional approach. That they respond to very well. They don't respond well to what they call lecturing in the human rights business. Uh, but it is possible to talk with Putin and the Russians, find common language. You got you got to watch your back all the time. You know the counterintelligence aspect of it, obviously, got to be a priority. I don't know if I answered your question. Um,
What's the condition of the SVR and SVHRU these days when compared to cold war services, more or less aggressive? Well, I think we already know, I mean, Read the um, statement of uh, Bill Ivanina, the National Counterintelligence Executive, and some other open statements. And uh, basically, uh, these top intelligence and counterintelligence professionals have identified Russia and China as the top counterintelligence threat. And obviously, you know, it was BGRU, uh, SVR. Do what they do. Um, how can U.S. private sector help U.S. national security stay abreast of Russian intelligence threats and active measures? Well, they're already helping right now. Companies like FireEye and uh, Mandiant and uh, CrowdStrike uh, by providing information. You know, obviously there needs to be information exchange. Um, and uh, early identification of uh, intrusions. And uh, uh, sometimes the technical experts who are not trained in intelligence tradecraft, they uh, interpret uh, failures, you know, IT failure, whether it's IT failure or satellite failure or any kind of failure, their first response is to fix the system. And to them, it's just a technical failure. They don't really look at it. Uh, as an influence operation, right? Uh, as the, you know, some they, they they don't think that somebody could look behind it. So there needs to be that kind of mindset. That's probably a good way to help. Um, leveraging um, AI and other emerging technology. How do you uh, assess Russia will develop the next generation information warfare? Um, yes, that's a big, uh, big deal, you know, for Russia. As uh, you may remember, uh, President Putin stated uh, a few months ago, I think, uh, that the country who, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, the country uh, that leads in AI and in artificial intelligence is going to control the world, right? So. Countries uh, like Russia and China always find a way to employ technology not necessarily as intended. Look at China, for example, what the Chinese president did with, uh, uh, with the domestic surveillance and actually developing databases of, uh, and rating people's trustworthiness, right? There's continuous surveillance. So when it comes to Russia, Russia obviously has also, you know, SORM, the, that's the internal uh, monitoring system. So when it comes to AI, I believe they are desperately, you know, searching for those magical answers. I also believe that with AI, it's going to be so much easier to conduct those kinds of uh, information confrontation operations, you know, those bots and trolls and whatever, it, it's just going to be so fast, it's going to be so uh, much more difficult to attribute. Uh, but they do, they do, you know, search those uh, answers, they do research, uh, how robust their research, I haven't done analysis on that specifically, um, I doubt they are ahead of us in that, but that's just speculation, they constantly comment how uh, advanced we are in, in, in these um, sciences. Um, how do current leaders are in government and society justify treatment of Magnitsky? How do they justify doping their athletes? Why is Putin one of the richest men in the world? Um, well, they don't justify anything. They just basically, you know, um, they just accuse, you know, the United States of uh, of actually waging the strategic deterrent strategy on them. They they don't really, you know, obviously they don't agree with their complicitness um, in those complicity rather in uh, in those things. They're doping. They they 
what they've done is uh, they, they hacked, you know, uh, the waiter and they try to demonstrate that other people do the same thing that they do. Um, so they have um, um, hacked into the information of U.S. athletes and, and, and others, and they try to portray, you know, look, you know, people do just the same. So it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it's the same thing, information confrontation. Um, multipolar world versus bipolar. Um, do leaders really believe that the U.S. is on to get them, or is it a construct? Russia asymmetrical tactics would appeal to Bill Donovan, yes. Um, so, so what is really the delta between the actual threat perception and the amplification of that threat for your own purposes? That's sort of the perennial puzzle for the analyst, right? It, it's both. I mean, do they believe that? Yeah, they do. Do they amplify that? Sure, big time. That, that's, part, that's part of the game. Russian asymmetric tactics would appeal. Yeah. Um, short of nuclear conventional war, what deters Putin from uh, future influence operations? Does he acknowledge any rule sets or norms for these types of activities? Deterrence is very hard. Um, we're on the right tracks with the sanctions. We are on the right tracks with indictments. They, by themselves, are not going to do the trick. Uh, we are on the right track with developing the capability uh, that has been identified in the nuclear posture review. Um, the Russians are going to complain no matter what because this is just what they do. This is what you do to your opponent. You either try to bind your opponent through um, through arms control agreements. You, you're going to you develop a counter capability, or you try to defeat your opponent psychologically. They're going to do what they're going to do. It is very difficult to deter. It's possible to sit down and, and maybe agree on some rules of engagement um, with regard to certain strategic you know, systems. They did say uh, that certain systems are off the table in terms of meddling with them, right? The, let's say the missile warning system, the, uh, the satellite uh, support infrastructure that supports our nuclear command control. Right? The Russians put it as a red line, and some and some other sectors, you know, chemical. Um, but um, <clears throat> the Russians will say in response, you know, they're going to push back and they're going to make a disinformation campaign out of our overtures, right? They're going to point to the, their efforts of trying to sign a space weapons ban and information weapon ban and say, you know, look, you don't want to talk to us. So it's going to be a constant, you know, back and forth. But, uh, but it is, they, they're not going to be a friend, but they can be a transactional partner whenever it suits their uh, national interest. It's just a matter of us deciding what it is that we can live with. You know, which of their flaws, so to speak, or their otherness, they do view the world differently. I don't want to portray that everything is disinformation and everything is a propaganda, although a lot of it is. But there's also a legitimate different worldview, legitimate to them. So that's uh, my response. How do you quantify the impact on RF, Jerry, UFSB, and SVR strategy coming not just from Putin, but also the combination of Dugin's um, doctrines? And uh, yes, the fourth, yes, yes. Um, work in Ukraine, Crimea, and Prigozhin, sorry. Um, is the aim of rage. So basically, you know, Dugan, for anybody who is not familiar, he is the proponent of Eurasianism. Eurasianism is an ideology 
that is a, uh, an imperial, traditional, um, uh, conservative, anti-American and anti-Western ideology that uh, believes that the West will eventually you know, collapse and Russia will prevail. And, um, and, and so Dugin actually is, um, is a proponent. The ideology itself, uh, I think, originated back in the 1920s. Uh, but Dugin is uh, the one who propagated it. And I actually believe that a lot of themes taken from Eurasianism and codified in Russia's strategic um, documents, they actually securitized national identity. They, um, they, 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 uh, they believe that uh, losing their identity is a threat. They sacralized the, um, the, the, the Russian church. Russian church now is effectively yet another statecraft instrument to pursue the foreign policy agenda. In fact, they are reaching out to our conservatives, to our evangelicals, to find some common ground. And there is some common ground, it's truth be told, there is some common ground, because we, some parts of our society, also are very, you know, adamant about preserving those traditional values, the traditional definition of marriage, you know, things like that, uh, with all due respect. Uh, however, my word to those people is that there's a fundamental difference between our conservatism who believe in freedom and liberty, and the government hands-off approach from the individual, and the Russian conservatives, the traditionalists, who believe the power of the state is central, and the individual just serves the state. So, so yes, I do, you know, I, I agree with you. I, I don't know how to quantify that. I don't have an algorithm uh, necessarily to quantify it, but. Uh, um, I think they view it as successful. Um, they, they view, you know, and it looks like the cost, their cost justify the benefit. You know, what Mr. Prigozhin um, uh, did with his company, and you know, they're challenging now, you know, uh, Prigozhin's uh, company, the uh, Concord uh, Management and Consulting, they're actually challenging the indictment in the United States court. Uh, Mr. Eric Duvalier and Ms. Catherine, I forgot the name of the second lawyer. Um, so, th so it's this issue is not going to go away. They actually view lawfare as yet another instrument of statecraft to push, you know, their foreign policy uh, agenda. And of course, the Pope is a master, you know, and sovereign democracy. Sovereign democracy is 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 also is a uh, it's almost like a cover word. I, you know, this is not analysis. This is just my uh, um, term. It's almost like a cover word. Obviously, there's no democracy, right? How can there be de true democracy, you know, when the journalists are assassinated, when the opposition is eliminated, whether it's Nitsov, whether it's, you know, Politkovskaya, you know, Skripal, obviously. You know, we don't know, you know, whether Putin directly or not is behind it. But look, I mean, no other country, I mean, who are those people? The Venezuelans that decided to do all these things? Or, you know, Cambodians? Come on. Um, so, um, so, yeah. Um, one more, what, just one more. Yes. Okay. I'm going to try to do Mr. Galagin's. Uh, he's not U.S. by country. K versus Soviet to losses. I thank you for reminding me. That was very big. You know, that's another reason. The Russians lost 20 million people in what they call the World Patri uh, the Great Patriotic War, right? The World War II. Uh, they do believe, they do sincerely believe that they don't get recognition for saving the world from fascism. And truly, they carry the brunt of that, you know, in terms of the, the, the population losses and the treasure. You know, everybody in their family, you know, including me, and I'm 
from there. I was born and raised there. I don't know if that was uh, stated in my so, uh, know somebody who was somebody in that war. So that goes part of that, you know, both uniqueness and um, um, presupposition of conflict and that, you know, exceptionalism. Um, how is Russia in era? Um, okay, if Mr. Golden could read to me then I'm not sure. How is Russia in era? Um, how is Russia in error in its perception of the threat from the U.S. and NATO? How is it in error? How are they in error? What are our intentions? What are our intentions? What are our and NATO's so intentions? our intentions actually um, have been declared in the nuclear posture review and the national security strategy, and my assessment is that. Our interests do truly collide with Russia's interests. We did identify, uh, we didn't say it explicitly, um, I don't have it here, but you could easily look it up. Uh, we basically committed ourselves again to democracy promotion. We did not stipulate it uh, clearly like that. Uh, basically what we said that we're going to uh, pursue uh, we're going to help our partners who uh, search, you know, a different way. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the exact verbiage. So um, they're in error that the U.S. seeks to conduct regime change. Obviously, we don't want to conduct regime change in Russia. Uh, who said which Russian, which U.S. document stipulates? that the United States seeks to conduct regime change, right? We have everywhere else. Hmm? We have everywhere else sought to pursue regime change. Well, it depends on how you, it, it depends on whose perspective, right? Some of these, uh, some of these uh, countries had legitimate popular protests because those Governments were so oppressive that the people decided to revolt, right? So it depends on how do you, the U.S. clearly pursues the responsibility to protect mission. To help certain societies with terribly oppressive regimes. So I think in that they're wrong. Nobody's trying that I know of, do you, who tries to conduct, um, conduct regime change in Russia? So I believe that's it. Right. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.